Um, great, so thanks. It's great to be here as part of this wonderful conference. Um, this is joint work with uh, Tim Moore, who's now at Melbourne University. Um, and we also want to thank Kath Kathleen and the Sloan Foundation for their generous support of this work, as well as the St uh, Stephen H. Sandell grant uh, through the Boston College Center for Retirement Research. Um, so I probably don't need to tell this group, but there's a lot of interest in understanding the effect of retirement on health, um, particularly given the aging of the population and recent reforms to retirement systems that are, are taking place in developed countries. However, um, health and retirement are actually inter, interdependent. What do I mean by that? Well, we all, we've been talking today about how um, health status, health outcomes can actually determine retirement. What I mean is usually it's the case that people who are in poor health retire earlier. And what that means is that any estimated um, associations between retirement and health outcomes don't necessarily represent causal relationships. And so our contribution to this literature is going to be to look at changes in health as people reach um, a point where uh, the rules for Social Security are sort of exogenously playing into their decisions about retirement. And that point is at age 62, which we heard in John's uh, talk yesterday, is a very salient age for determining uh, uh, Social Security benefit collection and, as it turns out, retirement behavior. So before I dig into that, I want to take a minute to, talk, to remind everybody that um, the effect of retirement on health is theoretically ambiguous, right? I might not need to talk about this because we were talking about it a lot yesterday, but you know, on the one hand, if jobs are mentally and physically taxing, uh, then it could be the case that retirement has protective effects on health, right? As an example, consider the construction worker who saves themselves from having a heart attack by retiring early. On the other hand, if jobs uh, provide mental and social stimulation in, in many of the ways that we were talking about yesterday, it could be the case that working longer has protective effects on health, especially relative to the counterfactual environment. Here's an example. Think about uh, the single person who, if they're working, is engaged with other people and doing lots of different things during the work week. Uh, but if they were to retire, they, uh, they might spend a lot of time alone, particularly if they don't find good mental and social substitutes for the type of things that they were doing at work. On top of those things, uh, retirement is often, often a very disruptive time for people. There's a lot of uncertainty, and there is a literature suggesting that disruptions have negative consequences for health. Um, and retirement is also associated with changes in financial resources and changes in health insurance that themselves can have independent effects on health. And so all of this is just, just to say that this is a very complicated, theoretically ambiguous question. And so we really need to turn to the data to start to try to understand the relationship between retirement and health. And that's what we're going to do today. So as I mentioned, we're going to utilize this, um, this change in Social Security eligibility that occurs when people reach age 62. It's actually most people first become eligible for Social Security benefit collection at age 62. Uh, as we heard, again, as we heard from John yesterday, depending on their cohort, uh, people are eligible to receive somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of their primary insurance amount if they retire at age 62. Uh, on average, among those that claim benefits at age 62, that translates into a monthly benefit for men of about $1,200 and a monthly benefit for women of about $900. So despite the fact that we heard all about yesterday how good it is for people to, to wait uh, and, and delay their benefit claiming, age 62 is a really salient age for the timing of Social Security benefit collection. And <laughs> we saw this, uh, some of this information from John yesterday, but here what we've done is taken uh, a 1% extract of Social Security administrative data and plotted the rate of new Social Security claims conditional on not having claimed at age by age 59, and we've done this for the cohorts born between 1921 and 1948, and we've done this by month of age in this graph. And the take up of Social Security at age 62 is striking. 31% of people claim Social Security within one month of turning age 62, another 5% claim within the next few, even just the next few months after that. And so it's this 
this, this variation right around age 62 that we're going to use, and we're going to look for changes in health right as people uh, reach age 62. Um, in order to do that, our measure of health is actually going to be what we think is a pretty important one. That's going to be mortality. And we use data from the National Center for Health Statistics, multiple cause of death data. This data represent the universe of deaths in the United States. It comes from the universe of death certificates in the United States. And importantly for our identification strategy, the restricted use version contains exact date of birth and date of death information, which is going to allow us to look uh, very closely around age 62 for changes in mortality. Um, we're going to do that in a regression uh, discontinuity, uh, age-based regression discontinuity design. This is very common in the literature, probably mo maybe most famously and most related to this work. It's been used by Nicole and her colleagues to look at um, changes in mortality uh, at age 65 when people become eligible for Medicare insurance. Um, and <laughs> the underlying assumption in our doing this is that there aren't other changes uh, right at age 62 in things like other government programs or other uh, retirement programs that will sort of discontinuously affect health in, at, right at age 62. And if that assumption is satisfied, then what we're going to estimate is uh, a local average intent to treat of Social Security eligibility, right? And I, I want to be clear that we're really just, that's, that's kind of all we can do. Um, but we don't actually think that there's something about being labeled Social Security eligible versus being Social Security ineligible that's causing people to either drop dead or somehow miraculously stay alive, right? What we think is actually going on is that, that there are a number of changes in behavior, the ones that I alluded to earlier, that are, that are changing people's health. And unfortunately, in this setting, we're not going to be able to um, causally you know, disentangle these mechanisms or attribute, different, um, attribute the effect to different mechanisms in a causal framework. But what I am going to do is try to show you some descriptive evidence that we think uh, points to certain mechanisms being the factor here. So there are changes, as I've already shown you, in Social Security claiming behavior. Uh, there are also, as I'll show you later, changes in labor supply and retirement behavior, as well as changes, uh, small changes in health insurance coverage. And then we've all been talking over the last 24 hours or so about uh, other changes, like changes in activity and stuff like that. Um, Right, so to preview the results, what we find is that at age 62, mortality increases on average for these cohorts between 1921 and 1948 by 1.5%. Um, that's largely driven by a 2% increase in the mortality for males. That 2% increase for males is statistically significant and um, completely, almost completely robust across any number of um, different specification choices that we uh, that we model. Um, there is also a 1% increase in the mortality rate of females. However, uh, that result, the, the result for um, females, is less robust to some of our modeling choices. And as you'll see, that's probably because women are just much less likely to die at these ages. And so the data on deaths for women at these ages is, is more noisy. And so um, we, we can't really, st you know, sort of statistically. Uh, determine a precise, as precise an effect. Um, OK, so to give you a graphic representation of the results, here what you see is we've plotted the number of deaths by month of age in relation to age 62. Uh, this includes the whole sample now. I'm not limiting this by gender. Um, and <coughs> what you can see is that there's a discontinuous increase in the number of deaths at, right at age 62 when people become eligible. Uh, for Social Security. Um, this translates into a change in the number of deaths, an increase in the number of deaths between the month before people are eligible and the month after, after people are, are eligible of about 1,500 deaths. And that compares to an average of just two or 300 deaths increase in any of the other consecutive month periods that we see in this graph. Um, uh, I, I see some folks whispering over there, and I wonder if what they're thinking about is that there's, you might notice that there's a dip in the number of deaths just before people reach age 62, and there's a slight maybe increase in the number of deaths just after people hit age 62. And so you might think that this is some sort of anticipation effect. Uh, I want to just get in front of that and say that we uh, model this differently using various donut hole techniques, 
using different weeks, uh, different measures of uh, bandwidth for mortality based on weeks and other things. And this estimate that I'm talking about, this 2% increase in mortality among males, does not rely on those types of choices, which suggests that this isn't being driven by any sort of delay in mortality that then, you know, we, that then appears right after people hit age 62. And I can return to that point later if there's time. Um, okay, so to unpack this overall effect uh, a little bit, I'm going to focus here on male mortality because that's where the estimates are most consistent. What we see is that the estimates for males are largest among those who are not married or among those with very low levels of educational attainment. We also see that the mortality increases are largest outside of institutions, and this is exactly what we would expect if what we're thinking about is retirement-related deaths rather than, um, you know, we wouldn't expect retirement deaths to be occurring, for example, for people in long-term care institutions. So this was sort of a, a nice placebo test. We also see the causes of death increases are largest among external causes and lung-related causes. And we think, we've hypothesized that that's because, um, well, particularly that the lung-related causes are because that oftentimes lung disease is a, is a type of um, disease that sudden shocks lead to sudden death. So that, um, that, th that kind of, those kinds of conditions might be particularly susceptible to sudden shocks like, uh, like retirement. Um, and as I mentioned, I'll get through, I'll get to, hopefully I'll get to the end where we're going to show suggestive evidence that this is really about changes in labor supply and other uh, lifestyle changes rather than about the Social Security claiming per se. Uh, so there's a long, liter a large literature of, um, exam a large literature examining the effects of retirement on health, broadly speaking. Many of you in this room have contributed to this literature. Sometimes people have used long-standing variation in Social Security rules like the one like the type we're using today to identify the effects of retirement on health. Um, other people have used policy changes. Um, and what we find is that, you know, despite this uh, wide range of settings and empirical strategies, or maybe even because of the wide range of settings and empirical strategies, there's, there's somewhat of a lack of consensus about the link between retirement and health. One reason could be that um, most of this research uh, has been somewhat hampered by the availability of data. We have the HRS and some other studies which are wonderfully rich, but often involve relatively large sample sizes. I say relatively, at least in the context of more recently available administrative data, like the data that uh, John and his co-authors used yesterday, and like the administrative data that we're going to use today. And that the, the larger administrative data sets are oftentimes useful because they can allow us to isolate very sm relatively small effects, um, you know, somewhat on the order of what we see today, but they're also going to be useful because they give us information about heterogeneity and potentially information about mechanisms. And so we hope that our, one of our contributions here is to, to be using some of this large administrative data to contribute to this really important question. So I've already described uh, the multiple cause of death data. Uh, I will say that it has some information uh, I like to describe this data set as a mile wide and an inch deep. Uh, you know, you get the universe of, of death certificate information, you know, death certificates in the U.S., but you have very little information. It's just whatever was recorded on the death certificate, including, you know, the date of birth and date of death, sex, uh, race, marital status, and education, as well as information about the cause and place of death. Uh, because of the limitations of this data set, we're going to supplement it with whatever uh, we can. And I'm open to suggestions. You know, we've tried a lot of data sets. I'm open to suggestions about more here. Uh, so we've uh, complemented this with the 1% um, extract of the Social Security administrative data that I showed you before, as well as information from the health and retirement study uh, that I showed you earlier. Because that data is, is so rich, it will at least help us create a descriptive uh, picture of what's going on, even though it doesn't have the type of sample sizes we would need to use in this type of um, with our type of empirical strategy. So this is the very basic uh, regression discontinuity uh, specification, uh, where the dependent variable is the log of mortality uh, at age of death, measured in months, uh, in relation to age 62. Um, we can, F of A represents how, that we control for the age mortality relationship on either side of the discontinuity. We're, we've done this using any number of functional forms for that age mortality relationship, including allowing it to vary uh, on either side of the discontinuity. Um, 
And then our variable of interest is this post 62 variable, which just represents uh, whether, someone had, whether someone's death occurs after age uh, 62. And um, as I mentioned, the estimates are result robust to any number of uh, choices about, uh, you know, the, there, there's this debate in the regression discontinuity literature about global parametric uh, specification choices or local non-parametric choices, and our results are generally, especially for the men, robust to all these choices, as I'll show you. Um, so this figure is much like the one I showed you earlier for the whole population, but here what we've done is on the left-hand side, we've plotted the number of uh, deaths per month of age in relation to 62 for males. And on the right-hand side, we've got the number of deaths per month of age for females. And what you can see here is uh, the same types of discontinuities that you saw in the overall population, uh, but that this discontinuity at age 62 is more pronounced for males than it is for females. And you can start to see what I'm talking about, which is the, uh, if you look at the vertical, the, the scale on the vertical axis, there are just many more deaths among men at these ages. And as you can see in the graph for females, the month to month variation in the number of deaths for females is much, much wider uh, in months other than at age 62 than it is for males. And so uh, turning to the regression estimates, here just to walk you through this table, the top panel presents the regression estimates of the coefficient beta, so the effect of uh, being just above age 62 on uh, log mortality. And uh, the top panel presents those using various functional forms for global parametric uh, regressions, including the quadratic, cubic, and quartic. Um, and then the bottom panel presents the same estimates using the local non-parametric regressions, local linear and local quadratic uh, estimates. And so what you can see in the first column is the overall estimate that I was talking about earlier, which is that on average, we're talking about an increase in mortality of between one and a half or 2% for the whole population. And that's largely driven by an even larger effect among males. So here, the results range from a 1.85% increase for males uh, to a 2.43% increase, uh, depending on the specification. And at the same time, the estimated effects of uh, reaching age 62 for females are slightly smaller, and you can begin to see what I was talking about where the results are not quite as robust to all of our specification choices. So for example, here the estimates for women range to only a half a percent to 1.38% um, increase. And you'll notice that in the uh, quadratic regression, the estimates are uh, not statistically significant at conventional levels. Um, <coughs> I don't have enough time here because I want to get to some of the descriptive work here, I don't have enough time to walk through all of the robustness checks that we do. Suffice it to say that the results, at least for men, are robust to a whole host of various specification choices. So I showed you these um, mortality, I showed you the mortality counts uh, using month of, of birth as the uh, running variable here. Uh, we, we chose month of birth because um, it, uh, it satisfied the Lee and Lemieux test for sort of appropriate bin widths. But we've also shown in the appendix of the paper, I believe, and we've also tested the uh, estimates using either daily or weekly counts of mortality. And the results are consistent across all of those, as well as um, adding in additional uh, characteristics, um, varying the bandwidth. As I mentioned earlier, various donut hole techniques to make sure that this wasn't something uh, extremely localized to just a month or two before or after age 62. And then also we've run placebo tests um, to, to determine, to make sure that this result sort of wasn't spurious, right? So you might just think, hey, you're talking about mortality when somebody turns age 62. Maybe this is really just about people becoming a year older. And there's actually an increase in mortality at 61 and 63. That turns out not to be the case. Um, and then similarly, we've also estimated uh, the discontinuity at all placebo ages between 57 and 67. And what you'll notice in this graph is that these are for men. Here we've plotted the, coefficient, the CDF of the coefficient estimates for any, uh, for sort of uh, setting up a placebo discontinuity at any month of birth between 57 and 67. And you'll notice from this graph that the coefficient estimates uh, for males are uh, actually, you know, 
well in the tail here. So that there's something special about what's going on right at age 62 in terms of an increase in mortality for males. Um, I should note as a side note that this, this is not true for females. The graph for this is in the paper for females and it's actually, uh, you know, the, the estimate for females lies within the range of other estimates, which is what I was talking about. The, the mortality levels are, are noisier for women by month. Okay, so as I mentioned, I wanted to talk a little bit about heterogeneity and potential mechanisms here. Um, so I mentioned earlier that the effects were largest among, and, and so I should back up and say that here I'm gonna focus now only on heterogeneity and possible mechanisms for men, since that's where our results are the most robust. We thought that was the most interesting place to look here. And so first of all, looking at marital status. And what we find here is that although there, are, there seems to be some effect among married men, the, the estimates, the point estimates are much larger for uh, not married men, and in fact, much larger for single men than they are for married men. Uh, some of these we can't, you know, we can't precisely statistically distinguish among these estimates, but the, the estimates for single men, for example, are on the order of a five or 6% increase in mortality, which is you know, really quite significant. Uh, at the same time, we've also looked at differences in the effect at age 62 based on uh, males educational attainment. And here we find that the effects are largest among those who did not complete high school. Uh, so here we see increases of, uh, on the order of 3% for men who didn't, uh, didn't complete high school and slightly smaller around 1 or 2% for people who completed high school or completed college. Now again, we can't you know, precisely distinct, statistically distinguish among these things, um, but we think that this is evidence that the effect is most strong among those who did not complete high school. As I also mentioned, that um, the effect is largely driven by people who die outside of institutions. Importantly, there's, you know, there's really no effect. This is a, a very small effect here for people who die in nursing homes or other long-term care institutions, which like I said, is, is a nice placebo check for us. And then here, as I, highlight, as I alluded to earlier, there's also differences in the estimated effect of um, reaching age 62 across different types of conditions. And where we see the effects are largest are among, uh, first of all, those with uh, COPD or, or lung cancer, and then secondly, among the group with external causes. I wanna note a couple of things here. One is that this estimate of, uh, is about three or four percent increase in mortality driven by external causes. That's almost all vehicle accidents. And this is also consistent with this other literature in the health, um, health economics world that suggests uh, that there are increases, I'm always gonna get this backwards, that there are increases in motor vehicle accidents in, uh, in good economic times, right? And so that, uh, this is consistent with that type of story. Um, but you'll note that these external causes are actually really a small fraction of all deaths. And um, importantly, the vehicle accidents are even, even smaller uh, fraction of all deaths. And then the second piece of this that I wanna take a minute to talk about is the COPD and lung cancer deaths. You know, we've, we've wondered about how to exactly to present this information because um, usually when we put up there that lung cancer deaths increase right at age 62, people, or say, oh, well, how can cancer is this sort of slow-moving, long-term condition? How can people die right at age 62 from lung cancer? Well, it turns out that the way these things are coded on the death certificates allows for multiple coding of, uh, or multiple categories of causes of death. And which one's chosen as the main cause of death is really up to the physician, right? And so someone might have listed lung cancer, but also pneumonia and COPD and other sorts of things. And so when we break this effect down into people who died whose single cause of death was lung cancer and they didn't have any of these other complications, we actually don't see any increase in single cause of death lung cancer at age 62. And so what's really happening is there's this increase in people dying from these other lung-related causes. And as I mentioned, we've, we've gone back to the medical literature and this seems pretty consistent with the people that have these types of conditions when their bodies are weakened by these types of conditions, a negative shock like getting pneumonia can actually cause you to die relatively quickly. And so we think that that you know, might be what's going on here. Uh, and I should have mentioned that that's actually you know, combined, these actually represent about 20% of all deaths. 
Um, okay, so really quickly, I just want to walk through some of the evidence that we talk about in the paper for different mechanisms. So there's a lot of stories about what could be going on at this point in time in people's lives, and we've, we're trying to unpack different pieces of evidence that we think could contribute to helping us figure out whether different explanations, so there's my time, I'm going to take one more, <laughs> one more second, and, uh, and just show you or talk about some of the ways that we've tried to come up with descriptive evidence to unpack this effect a little bit. So one story you could think of uh, is that maybe that this is so, some sort of payday effect, right? That when people get their social security check, this is, uh, you know, they're flush with cash, uh, there's a literature on this in economics. Actually, my co-author Tim Moore, along with Bill Evans, have actually used the variation in Social Security check paydays to examine its effect on mortality. And they do, in fact, find that people are more likely to die within the day or week after they receive their Social Security check. So this is, this is very much a payday effect. And we do see some evidence of this type of payday effect in the following way, which is if we look at mortality by week in the data, the mortality in the week after you turn age 62 is higher than in the second week after, in the third week after, in the fourth week, week after. But there is still an increase in mortality in the second, third, and fourth weeks relative to the weeks just before you turn age 62. And so we do think that some of what could be going on, a little piece of this might be the payday effect. But in fact, what happens is the payday effect is an extra effect above and beyond this 2% mortality increase that we see uh, for men. More generally, you could th think that this is about the effect of just having more resources, right? More income could be bad for people's health. And that's sort of the story with the cyclical literature that I was talking, that's one of the possible stories in the cyclical literature that I was talking about earlier. Um, but there's a couple of pe pieces of evidence that we think, um, that lead us to believe at least that that's not really what's going on. One is that um, there's variation in how much, how much uh, in the size of someone's benefit based on the cohort that they were born in. And we don't see differences in the mortality effect for people in different cohorts. So we don't think that this is just having more income makes you uh, worse off. Uh, and then additionally, the patterns of claiming uh, are consistent across gender, but mortality patterns are not. And so we have to look for something else that varies across gender in ways that are correlated with some of the mortality differences that we see. The same thing, these patterns of claiming uh, are different across um, men with different socioeconomic characteristics, but in, in ways that don't, aren't, aren't congruent with the mortality effects that we see. And so instead, we, we looked for other things that might vary in the same way the mortality effects do. And, and two things that potentially could be explanations are the changes in labor force and retire, labor force participation in retirement, and then also changes in health insurance status. And so here's where, I've ta where I was talking about. We brought in the HRS and just looked at people and um, tabulated their answers to various questions in the survey period just before and after they turned age 62 and looked for differences across, um, across people who claimed right at 62 right before and after they turned 62. And so you can see in the first row, for example, men who claim Social Security at 62, 45% of them were partially or full, fully retired in the interview before they were 62. 84% were partially or fully retired in the interview after they turned 60, 62, which represents a, about a 39% increase, percentage point increase in, the, um, in, the, in being retired for these men. For women, it's, it's actually smaller. So it's only a 30 percentage point increase in being retired. And then similarly, we see that the non-married are more likely, the non-married who claim at age 62 are more likely than the married who claim at 62 to retire, as well as the, uh, the lowest educated are more likely, who claim at 62 are more likely to retire right at 62 than the, the more educated. And so this seems consistent, this pattern of estimates is consistent with our pattern, or this pattern of uh, information is, is consistent with our pattern of ex estimates across the, across the different characteristics. And so we think that this is at least suggestive evidence that the estimate we're getting has something to do with retirement behavior. It's a similar sort of pattern across labor force participation or working for pay that we see in retirement. And then um, the, we don't attribute much to the effect of health insurance coverage because although there are changes in health insurance coverage at age 62, that the pattern of those changes doesn't fit 
the pattern of our mortality estimates as nicely as these changes in uh, retirement behavior. But of course, again, you know, all of this is descriptive. So we're really not ruling anything out. We're just sort of trying to find suggestive evidence to help tell the story. So overall, there's a clear increase in male mortality at age 62 uh, of about 2%. You might think that this is small. Um, and, but I want to sort of remind you that health uh, and, and mortality specifically is a stock variable, right? This is a thing that we think of generally as being hard to change quickly. And so these small increases in mortality at age 62 may represent uh, larger changes in health. It may represent a broader set of negative health effects. Uh, and it, it would be useful to start to try to understand um, the effects of retirement on other types of health. And, you know, uh, I should also say a caveat that the RD design is limiting in some ways. It, it makes it difficult to assess how local to age 62 these effects are. And it's also not going to allow us to look for changes, for example, in the slope of mortality at age 62, which also might occur if you think that health is this stock variable that begins to de decay when people reach retirement rather than that there's a, a sudden shock in when people reach retirement. Thanks very much. Uh, so I'm Andrew Goodman Bacon. I'm the current and last RWJ scholar at UC Berkeley, and I'll be at Vanderbilt in the fall. Um, I'm, uh, I was really happy to get a chance to read this paper carefully and, uh, and, and to discuss it, because I think it's fascinating, and I think it's really well done. Um, and I think, as Maria touched on, I think there's some big open questions uh, in relation to the, to the main analysis. Um, so uh, the point, of, I mean, the main part of the paper is really easy to describe, as we Everybody here obviously knows, and we've been talking about, there's this huge discontinuous jump in Social Security claiming at age 62. And what Maria and Tim do is to bring really high quality data and a, and a really well done analysis to show that there's also a big increase in mortality at that age. And that's, I'm not going to talk much about that because they do a really good job. It's clearly a feature of the world. It's there. Um, uh, but what I think what's open and, and, and really interesting is, is to understand why that would actually be true. Um, so I'll spend most of my time uh, touching on that. Um, but before I do, I want to briefly say the one, make the one comment I have about their handling of the mortality data, um, which relates to the fact that their cohorts include, uh, include those born between 1921 and 1948. And that encompasses this big uh, shift up in births that occurred when, right after World War II. So these are basically quarter three, 1946 through 47. There's this big spike in births, and you can use the census to show that they're the kids of veterans. Uh, and I, I think this is something to pay attention to because um, uh, they're using death counts as the outcome variable. And so they're, they're, this change in the difference in size of the birth cohort translates pretty directly into changes in the size of the death counts. So this is just taking three years of the multiple cause of death data and plotting the death counts by age. And so you can see as this 1946-47 cohort moves through the survey years, there's a noticeable shift down in the number of people from those cohorts who die. So it's worth pointing out that this is going to, oops, this is going to make their estimates too small, actually, because in the year when the uh, sort of the, the, the spike of births is, are, those guys are younger than the troughs, so they're going to be on the left side of the age discontinuities. But it might be worth separately accounting for this cohort, um, when, especially when they're trying to understand the magnitude of the mortality jump and uh, maybe even some of the heterogeneity. OK, so to understand, I think the first step in the paper to understand why, uh, why the jump is there is to identify heterogeneity in the size of this mortality discontinuity. And so it's bigger for men. It's bigger for the lowest men with the lowest levels of education. It's biggest for unmarried men. And it's biggest for white men. So first of all, I think this is an interesting pattern that suggests that's kind of promising for understanding the mechanisms, because it doesn't always line up with some other story like SES. I mean, for white men have a bigger jump than non-white men, but it's the low education that have a bigger jump than the higher education men. So, um, so why? So this is also again these, this heterogeneity is like shown very clearly and is clearly a feature of the of the data. But why is that true? So the the story that they're so the approach is to look for different uh, sort of treatments, different first stages that are they're correlated with this heterogeneity, and that's the main strategy in the paper to 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 argue that that the any any of the mortality effects are due to one one behavioral response or another. 
Um, what's a little more difficult, and I think might be more speculative at the end, is once you have a story for different first stages in mind, then you can start to, you know, any, any place where that diverges, uh, mortality diverges from the first stage story, you can, you can wonder, you can start to speculate whether that's just heterogeneity in the response. Uh, and so the way that they match up the mortality heterogeneity with, with sort of behavioral responses to use the HRS, and this is the part of the paper that I was, I think is interesting, and I think it's the right tack, but I was a little less convinced by the HRS analysis for a number of reasons. So first of all, the, the, the HRS analysis looks at labor supply and health insurance in the HRS, and they condition on respondents who receive Social Security uh, in their age 62 interview. Um, so that's good because that's, that's focusing on, on the people we think are treated by the discontinuity, but I think it, I think it has some limitations because it's going to be a selected sample based on, especially with respect to things like labor force participation. We saw yesterday that the early claimants are less healthy, so, looking at, so focusing just in on the people who, who take it up might be getting people who have sort of a counterfactual reduction in, in labor force participation anyway. Um, and it's, it's a little hard to use uh, the HRS, to, HRS estimates that are just focused on the claimants to do sort of an implicit IV in my head where I'm comparing the sort of the mechanism evidence to the population intention to treat estimates uh, that use the mortality counts. And then also the HRS sampling frame means that these are, these are just, they're not nearly as, re as refined as the monthly mortality counts. They're, they're in some cases comparing people between 61 and 63 or 60 and 62. Um, and I think that can really matter here because of course this analysis is focused on just the discontinuity, but if you look at the mortality counts that they, in their main figure, the jump is 1,500 deaths, but the difference between the endpoints is like 8,000 deaths. So anywhere there's a trend, that's going to be kind of built in to these coarser HRS comparisons before and after age 62. So what I'm going to show you for the rest of the day is similar evidence to what they generate uh, in the HRS, but using um, recent, more recent waves at the ACS where they ask about birth quarter. So it's not as good as monthly, but it's a little better than every two years. Um, and I, I think the story that I that I come away with is similar, but maybe not quite as tightly connected to the mortality jumps as, as the HRS analysis. So you can do in, the, you can do in uh, the same sort of social security claiming first stages in the ACS. Uh, and everything I'm going to show you focuses on the three, three of the margins of heterogeneity. So comparing men across um, education categories, comparing white men to white women, and comparing white men to non-white men. So as they say in their paper using the administrative data, um, the size of social security claiming is not that different across any of these margins of heterogeneity. So the thick line is always going to be the sort of focal group, the low education white men. So their, their increase in social security claiming is, is about the same size as other education groups. It's about the same size as white women, and it's about the same size as non-white men. So uh, this sort of suggests that social security claiming as sort of a rough definition of the, of the relevant treatment. Um, that differences, there are, no, there are not differences there that can explain exactly the mortality, which again is on the paper. So one of the other hypotheses is that it's insurance coverage. That's another thing that is, can be measured in the same quarterly way in the ACS. And again, for none of, there's not really as strong evidence uh, looking at these, at the way I'm calculating it, that there are any of these shifts in insurance. So again, it's not a huge focus in the paper, but I think it's, I think it's I'm less convinced of it than, than I am looking at the HRS table in the, in the paper. So again, across none of, these, none of these distinctions do white men have especially large reductions in our insurance. It doesn't seem like a, a very strong margin. So probably not insurance. Um, so is it, is it income? Is it the amount of resources? I mean, again, I, I'm not that convinced uh, that, that total resources are changing. Maybe they're changing in, the, in a broader window, but it, it doesn't seem like they're changing nearly as discontinuously as Social Security claiming. So, Low education white men sort of have a reduction in total income after, after they turn 62, but it's not that sharp. Uh, maybe there's something there if you were to sort of compare their, their immediate reduction to, between white men and white women. Um, and maybe there would be something there, but it's, it's pretty noisy even, you know, comparing white men to non-white men. So I'm less convinced that sort of income and total resources are part of the mortality story. Um, and then, of course, there's the main, the main hypothesis in the paper is that it's due to changes in, in labor supply. Um, and so I think here the story that I'm, I get from the ACS data is a little more mixed than the, than the heterogeneity that they find in the HRS data focusing on the claimants. So I mean in the, in the HRS table in the paper there, there is a bigger reduction in labor force participation um, for the low education men, but that doesn't seem to be true looking at the sort of the population level in the ACS. That these increases in being out of the labor force are of a similar size uh, across the education groups. 
the heterogeneity lines up much, much better um, between white men and white women and between white men and non-white men. So I think there is, I think there's some, there is some reason to believe that the, the changes in labor force participation, retirement, et cetera, uh, are a reasonable guess about what the, what the first stage heterogeneity is that could lead to the sort of mortality heterogeneity. Um, but I guess I want to conclude by saying even though, so I think that's a promising story, uh, and I think there's a number of ways they could sort of uh, extend it. I mean, the gen so like I said, the gender and the race heterogeneity line up relatively well. Um, I think there's other opportunities to kind of flesh out the story. So there's a recent paper by Dan Fetter and Lee Lockwood that looks at um, old age assistance in, in 1940, full count 1940 census, and finds comparing higher or lower benefit states finds huge effects on being out of the labor force. So this is another area where mortality, that's, a, that's an age 65 discontinuity before Social Security was really even a big program. At this time, OAA was way bigger. Um, and this is just another area that could, I think, maybe sort of flesh out the story about uh, uh, labor force participation being a mechanism for mortality changes. Um, but finally, I, even though I think there's reasonable evidence that discontinuities in labor force participation match reasonably well with discontinuities in mortality, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not totally sure why that would be true. I mean, I think it's a, an interesting open question. I, I, I think it makes sense but in some, in some way, but I'm not totally sure. So, you know, we have evidence that displacement increases mortality. Um, but, that, but that paper finds that uh, the mortality effects are driven by the earnings losses of displacement, and that doesn't seem to be a strong feature of the labor force participation changes at age 62. Um, so then we have, there's the timing evidence that obviously Tim Moore is, is worked on a lot, um, you know, that in Social Security increases within month mortality, but a lot of these people were getting paychecks in a cyclical way before they went to Social Security, so it's not clear that their cyclicality changes in some major way when they cross the threshold. Um, and so I, I was wondering if you could check day of the month, pre-post 62, but there's a sort of weekly analysis that is maybe consistent with some, to some extent, cyclical mechanisms kicking in on, on the other side of the 62 discontinuity. Um, and then if the story is that reductions in labor force participation increase mortality, I think that seems to go against the notion in some of the other cyclicality papers and some of the sort of business cycle mortality papers that suggest economic activity increases mortality. So if you're, if you're moving out of the labor force, that might suggest that you're doing less of the potentially risky activities like maybe driving to work, for example, um, that, would, that would lead you to have these external cause deaths. So I, actually, in some sense, I think that the individual level labor force transitions go the opposite way of what you might think the sort of business cycle labor force, uh, a business cycle mortality relationship would, would suggest. So, um, so just, to, I mean, I think these are open, I think these are questions on which progress can be made, and I think they're really interesting. Uh, and I think that the main result of the paper, that there's this more, there is this big jump in mortality is very real and interesting and like really worth understanding more. So thanks very much. Um, so, a couple of comments. One, uh, the what, what Mike and I were just at, were asking a much more uh, pedestrian question, which is just how big is this effect? And one percent doesn't sound very big. On the other hand, if you look at your graph, and I, maybe I'm a time series macroeconomist, and I'm used to extrapolating more than delicate re regression discontinuities, it was sort of going up, and then it goes up, and it really looks like a permanent shift in a linear trend. So, yeah. so it, it's so I so. The impact effect is not that big, but it's, it really looks permanent, uh, which A, makes it bigger, and B, really probably has suggestions about what the mechanism is. It doesn't look like it's a transition effect. It really looks like it's a, a, a state effect. Uh, the, the second question is, I, I, this is just a question about what data, Social Security data you're using. Are, are you just using the benefits record? Because I would think if you had the earnings record, you could look to see which of these claimants uh, had non-trivial earnings in 61. So, and you could separate between the people, the claiming effect of, of Social Security and the claiming and retirement effect. Uh, it's not perfect, uh, but I think, I think you could get a lot of traction within the Social Security data if you, if you do have the earnings record as well as the benefits record. Yeah, thanks. Uh, those are both great comments. Um, the, we wanted to do something along the lines, I think, of what you were thinking in the second one, which is use information about who was um, you know, uh, attached to the labor force before they claimed and look at mortality separately by those. Unfortunately, we, we cannot merge the Social Security claiming behavior with the, 
data with the mortality data, we had hoped to be able to use the Social Security Administration's death information. Uh, my understanding from talking to Tim and other folks is that actually the quality of the death, date of death information in the Social Security data is actually quite poor. I don't know if anybody else has any better information about that since it's, it's my first foray into using the Social Security Administration data. But uh, we'd, we'd be open to suggestions about how to use that date of death information in the Social Security data for just this reason, is that we hope to be able to use the earnings information to unpack it. So we do have that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Microphone pop. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nicole Mastis. Um, yeah. So I didn't follow. It looked like you were you supple, You said you supplemented the NCHS data with information from the master beneficiary record about death. I, I didn't quite. All I mean is that we're using the beneficiary information to look at claiming patterns, like I talked about. I don't mean that we're able to merge them in this. Oh, so you're okay. So you I weren't. Didn't. What I was worried was that you were maybe um, using that as kind of a second check on reported death. No, in fact, because we're worried about uh, this Good. quality of the information, yeah. so I'm glad to hear you confirm what our suspicions were. Yeah, yeah, well, we, you know, yeah, the, the issue that I think we talked about before was that the um, Social Security Administration tries a little bit harder to um, get accurate death information for people once they enter claimant status. Mm -hmm. So I was worried right. if you were going right. in and kind of selectively bolst, you know, like, like using that information mm -hmm. to improve whatever is wrong with the basic NCHS, you'd be... Yeah, but no, good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I was just thinking on the point that uh, Matthew was <clears throat> that, making about uh, in, your, in your response to uh, say the, 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 the quality of the data for the, I think you said uh, the income, income data from, you said there was poor quality and I, and I, and I the death data. The Social well, Security death record is much worse quality because of, I guess, this thing that Nicole mentioned, which is that Social Security has more incentive to accurately track deaths of claimants versus non-claimants. Okay, well, let me not make a comment because I've got okay. <laughs> okay. 